This week on The Gadget Show. In our latest head-to-head challenge, Jason and I find out whether there's such a thing as a big, cheap flat-screen TV that's any good. I'm trapped in the telly! And John tests a hybrid style of digital camera by photographing dogs going off, hens pole dancing and hills just sort of sitting there and looking pretty. Hello and welcome to The Gadget Show. Sit back, relax and enjoy. But at the same time, could you please sit up and pay attention? Because we've got something serious to talk to you about. Free Wi-Fi. Or more specifically, the Gadget Show's campaign for free Wi-Fi. It's a campaign that we launched a few months ago with the aim of persuading the government to provide free wireless internet access for every town and city in the UK. Essentially, that would mean that uh, if you took your laptop or your PDA or your mobile phone out into the street, into your normal working life or at the weekend when you're chilling out, you'd be able to get hold of a quick and efficient broadband connection wirelessly without having to pay through the nose for it. Because yeah. a lot of cafes and restaurants do charge ridiculous amounts of yeah, money. Yeah, really expensive. And it's quite a, a lot to ask, I know, but so far we've been pretty successful yeah, more than well. 30,000 of you have been onto our website and signed up for free Wi-Fi and um, in fact some of you have gone even further so for that we thank you yeah thanks very much we'll, sh we'll show you some of the efforts so far hello Tony Blair we all want free wireless internet everywhere in the whole world from on behalf of the gadget show <laughs> fantastic they just love that. It's really good that people have made the effort to make little it's, videos, I, I think. I think it's brilliant. I mean, you know, he could have made his bed, but then when you're a revolutionary... You don't have time. You don't have time, Suze. If you <laughs> want to make a video, feel free, please. No, that's great support, thanks. And also, it means that the government now can't say that they're not aware of our campaign or, indeed, your support for it. And last week, Jason visited Westminster to hand over a list of names. In fact, 36,273 names. It's so impressive, don't you think? Mm. The only problem was that my march on the seat of government didn't quite go as I planned. Firstly, we contacted the Department of Trade and Industry, whose responsibilities include science and technology. Interestingly, though, they said that our free Wi-Fi campaign was not part of their area and instead referred us to the Department of Communities and Local Government. Which sort of made sense, as they are a government department that are usually responsible for funding large-scale public access projects. But they turned us away, maintaining that free Wi-Fi was a DTI matter. But the DTI sent us a speech by the Minister for E-Government, Angela Smith, that discussed the importance of digital inclusion and the instalment of a citywide Wi-Fi network, all of which is to be funded by the DCLG. So we contacted the DCLG again, only to be turned away again. Apparently a representative in there said that Angela Smith has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. After several more weeks of phone calls to both the DTI and the DCLG, we still had no success. It remains a mystery as to who is responsible for Wi-Fi in the UK. That is absolutely appalling. So nobody in government wanted to take responsibility for Wi-Fi at all. I'm still clueless as to who we should be talking to. But you know what? I didn't stop there, Suze. I took uh, your petition to none other than number 10 Downing Street. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be sat here saying that we're waiting for a reply, but, and I mean this sincerely, two hours ago, a reply arrived from number so. 10. Well, first of all, considering it's from number 10, it says hi. Which I think is... <laughs> I think it's, Kind of cool, kind of relaxed. I'm sorry to inform you that your petition has been rejected. Oh. Your petition was classed as being in the following categories, commercial endorsement, promotion of a product, service or publication. Ah, because we're a television show. Oh. But those are real people's I names. I know they are. I know, this is the thing. <laughs> Let's be honest, Susie, if, if, if the government are going to be so blooming useless, then maybe there is an argument for business to get involved. In fact, we saw some research which compared uh, businesses offering free Wi-Fi mm. with those offering a pay-for-Wi-Fi service. And it showed that the free Wi-Fi encouraged more customers in, which led to an increase in business. Yeah. In incredible, but it's there in and, black and white. And they've already cottoned on to this in America. If you look at their hotel chains, like um, Comfort, Radisson, Best Western, all those chains offer free Wi-Fi access to their customers. And probably unsurprising in a way where service is king, but now the customer expects free Wi-Fi, and that's the point. You're so right, Susan. And let's not even talk about South Korea and Japan, where, it's, you, know, where, where you get connections everywhere you walk. Mm. OK, um, if you're a business and you can see an argument for this, you, you think your customers deserve free Wi-Fi, uh, then we've taken all the guesswork out of it. All you've got to do is go to our website, where we've got an easy-to-follow guide to setting up your own free Wi-Fi hotspot. 
if you maybe go to a gym or a cafe or anywhere where you hang out really, go to them and say, we want to have free Wi-Fi. And when they turn around to you and say, oh, it's too expensive, send them to our website and we'll show them how to do it for just a few hundred pounds and they will increase See, their I'm, profit. I'm not, I've done it. It's really quite straightforward. In fact, it's so straightforward. Last week, I built a gadget that turned me into a free Wi-Fi hotspot. And here is everything you'll need to bring Wi-Fi to the community. A backpack, a wireless router, a means of connecting to the internet in the shape of a 3G card, and some power, a 12-volt battery. Believe it or not, this is good for a minimum of 12 hours free surfing. Most of the hard work's already been done by Linksys, the people that make this router. It's one of the only ones that I know of on the market that takes a 3G card in a little PCMCIA slot on the side there. And luckily, it needs 12 volts to power it out of the box, which makes things really easy. Already, my card is flashing. Blue means I've got 3G. I then press this button on the front, and voila. I'll try and start up my browser. There it is. Brilliant. Look at that. It loaded really quickly. Great. All I've got to do now is stuff it in my bag and find some punters who want free Wi-Fi. Hello, I'm a hotspot. Would you like to plug in? Free Wi-Fi, mate. Take a break. Take the weight off. Free Wi-Fi with your sandwich there, my darling. Oh, here we are. Have a look at this. That's already, that's that's already connected. It, it has. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we spend most of our time here doing work. You <laughs> Not do. attempting yeah. to over right, a coffee. Connect. It's really difficult. Certain cafes uh, where you can connect with ease, but you've got to pay, you know, six quid, 15, 15 minutes. Quid. 15 yeah. minutes. Free Wi-Fi, guys, if you'd like to plug into me. Look. It's real. That's well impressive. Isn't it? If you do need to connect, I'll be around the area, all right? I'm a free Wi-Fi hotspot. Feel free to connect. God, it, Windows looks so much cooler in Norwegian. It really does. In the UK, I don't know what it's like in Norway, but in the UK, uh, there isn't a kind of countrywide free Wi-Fi network. Uh, Trondheim, where she's from, yep. it's a free internet connection all over the town. For really? Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Can it connect to me? Check your emails. Don't laugh. We'll all be wearing that next year. Um, OK, now, um, back to the important stuff. Today's <laughs> challenge. You really put me off there. Uh, as is often the case, Susie and I were only told where to be and at what time. That one looks really tasty. Oh. That's my favourite. Oh, I almost got it. Oh, they're broken. They're obviously broken. But your hand's broken. Mm -hmm. Dear Jason and Susie, today you're taking part in the snappily named Great big flat screen TV for a flipping low price gadget show challenge. Great, I love this. Definitely snappy. You must nice. each head out into the big wide world and buy the very best flat screen TV you can for under a thousand pounds. That's quite a challenge. Ah, that's good. The TV must have a screen size of over 40 inches. Ah, and it must be HD ready. Remember, you're prowling tigers. Go get them. Actually, it's quite interesting about the 40 inches because that's the area where the line gets blurred, isn't it? LCD does small screens yeah, the best, right. plasma does big screens the best. Very, very difficult. That that is the kind of that's the area where they're, they're most competitive. Those two formats. Yeah, I think um, I might do all right. In this no, challenge. I think you'll be all right. Definitely. I think it's going to be quite. Um... Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah. Hang on a second. And you can't just ring your mates who write for the specialist TV magazines and go with what they Sorry, say. I have to go. That's considered cheating in this challenge. Thanks, Mum. And we'll see you stripped naked, tarred Ooh. and feathered. Hang on. I'll just bring you back. Yeah. Oh, damn, I've gone. There are certainly a lot of flat screen TVs to choose from, with over a thousand different models on sale in Britain alone. In fact, sales of flat screen TVs in Western Europe in 2006 were worth over 12 billion pounds and accounted for a third of all consumer electronic sales. I'm trapped in the telly. <laughs> hey, hey, oh, don't. Oh, could you get my chin? Oh, thank you. My nose, yeah? Eh, thanks. But despite the choice and the size of the market, this could be one of the most difficult challenges we've faced because the quality of flat screen TVs varies so much between beautiful magnificence and utter pants. But brilliance does come at a cost. This 50-inch plasma TV from Pioneer is reckoned by many experts to be the best flat screen TV that you can buy at the moment. The problem is, it'll cost you five grand. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, some screens are just utter rubbish. The kind of no-brand screens that you find in supermarkets or non-specialists. Uh, they use two or three-year-old panels that really aren't worth your money, and often, they're not HD-ready. 
As a rule of thumb, avoid anything over 32 inches that costs less than £500, especially if you've never heard of the manufacturer. So, for the best quality, it appears you need to pay a lot of money. And the bigger the TV gets, the more it's likely to cost you. And we were supposed to find big TVs that are great quality but cost under a grand. Hmm. Now, whatever flat screen telly you buy, and whatever the price, you should get one with a built in Freeview digital tuner. It's not tricky to work out. In fact, usually it'll say on the spec sheet. This one doesn't, so if you're not sure, don't be shy to ask. Watch. I'll demonstrate. Excuse me, has this Hi. got a built-in digital tuner? Uh, the Philips 42-inch LCD, yep. yes it has. There you go. We are now firmly in the high-definition age, and here's a fact that I've told you before, but it's so important, I'm going to make sure I say it again, 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 again. If you're buying a flat-screen HD-ready TV, you've got to make sure it's got one of these, an HDMI socket. It's through that socket and this HDMI cable that all the high-def pickies get into your TV. If a telly is labelled as HD-ready, that means it's got all the right bits to watch full, glorious high-def. Now we come to, by far and away, the most important aspect of any television, the picture quality. Buying a TV is almost exclusively about getting the best picture quality you can for your money. And the biggest question when it comes to picture quality on a flat screen TV has to be LCD or plasma. I reckon LCD has the edge here. It's a much sharper, crisper image especially when you feed it an HD signal. And it's my opinion that LCD as a technology has got loads more potential for development, unlike plasma, which I reckon has seen its best days. Really? Is that what you reckon? <laughs> well, you're entitled to your own opinion. And I know that plasma screens aren't flavour of the month with everybody at the moment, but the fact is, it does offer the best picture quality, right? Blacks are blacker, colours are truer, and because of the way that it processes the picture in a more simple way, you don't get that horrible blurring effect on movement that you still get on some LCDs. OK, but LCDs are lighter, they apparently last longer than plasmas, they consume less electricity than the equivalent plasma. Mm. Oh, and plasmas suffer from altitude sickness. I'm serious, when you put a plasma in a high-altitude environment, OK, it affects the pressure in the gases that make the plasma screen work, OK, and it makes the screen go all wibbly. And that's why you'll never see a plasma screen in Quito, uh, La Paz or Bogota. Uh, yes, but I don't live in Quito, La Paz or Bogota. That's irrelevant. No, it isn't. All right, it's not, but my point still stands. No, it doesn't. It does? It doesn't! It does! No, it doesn't! It does! It doesn't! It doesn't. Where is La Paz, anyway? Uh, it's in Bolivia. It's the highest capital city in the world. Ah, oh. clever ass. Got a bit of a fluff there. The fact is that we could be heading for a bit of an LCD versus plasma war. Because though LCD had seemed to be getting the upper hand over the past year or two, now three big plasma producers, Panasonic, Pioneer and Toshiba, have got together and launched a big, noisy campaign to promote plasma across Europe. Yep, and recently they published the results of independent research showing that in home conditions, plasma performed better than LCD in picture quality, colour and sharpness. Not in my flat in La Paz, though. Oh, you bloody idiot. So, which is best? Well, Susie seems set on buying plasma. Don't cut it for me, love. And I'm definitely going for LCD. The picture quality is much better on the plasma. What's so sure. If we both get the absolute best we can for a grand, then I think when we test them head to head, we'll be able to shed a little light on this which is the best debate. But to get the best, you have to buy from the leading manufacturers in each technology. Right now, we reckon the best producers of plasmas are Pioneer and Panasonic. And the best producers of LCDs are Samsung and Sony. If you stick with those brands, you're not going to go far wrong. Be as modest as you can bear with screen size, but spend as much as you can afford. But obviously I'm going to win. I mean, the, the, you know, that's the issue today. It's clear, I think, that I've got the better screen. I'm winning this today. No, no, do you not understand in how fact, it works? You know, if, I win, no, if I win, yeah. you can't win. That's not going to happen. I, I actually, at this point, can see an advantage of working with John.
So we've chosen our tellies and I've gone for this, a Samsung LCD 40 inch. It cost me 989 pounds and I reckon it looks the business, both in terms of the design mm -hmm. and the picture quality. And I have gone for this Panasonic 42 inch plasma TV that cost me 879 pounds, two inches bigger than Jason's and a little bit cheaper uh, because I thought it had a better picture. Always going for the hard sell, aren't you, Perry? Well, I think, I think what's fair to say, something that we might agree on, is that these two TVs represent uh, the best value for money if you're looking for an over 40-inch flat-screen TV that's under £1,000. Exactly. Yeah? But how to test them? Mm. Join us later when we put these two screens to the ultimate test, something we call TV football. Yep, one pitch, 22 men, two tennis, <laughs> and 90 minutes of... Squeaky bum time. Hey. That's what we call it when we play five a side. Squeaky, squeaky bum, time. bum time. Yeah, because you get down the wing after you know about 90 minutes, you get a bit squeaky, didn't you? <gasps> what? What have I said? Every week on the critical list, we look at what's latest and what's best in a certain area of gadgetry. This week, we're looking at digital radios. John? Now, in my opinion, Pure have always made the best dab radios. Mm. And this one's really exciting. It's the latest version of their Evoke, the Evoke 3. It's got a lot of things you might expect on an ultimate dab radio. It's got a seven-line display, stereo speakers. You can record to SD card, or you can pause and replay live radio. All features we've seen before. What's great about this is that it also has an electronic program guide, like you get on a Sky Plus or something like that. And you can actually see what's coming up on radio stations Pays ahead wow. and set it to record in oh, advance. That's good. You see? Awesome. So you sort of press guide, and there's all the programs. You can it's quite easy to use, is it? Very quite? easy to use. Around. And you can get up to 30 hours on, say, a 2 gigabyte SD card. I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. A sort of ultimate dab raid also sounds pretty good as well. Very important. OK, the genus Type R. The reason I chose this is because it just looks gorgeous. It looks like a 1960s hacker Very retro, Harrier. isn't it? Thank you, John. <laughs> I knew that you'd know the, the original <laughs> on which this is based. I mean, it's got a lovely retro feel to it. Can you just touch that? Is it cold to the touch, Suze? Oh, it is. Because it's real al aluminium, it's not plastic, Yay. which is a, a strange concept to us gadgeteers. This here, look, uh, the wood on the side is real walnut. It's like having a Rolls Royce for your radio and on the handle. Uh, but the, the sexiest bit is the... Uh, interface, which is all 2007, okay? Yeah. So retro styling, but with top end tech. You touch it, and the whole thing comes mm -hmm. to life. Did you see that? In fact, you don't even have to touch it, you can just wave your hand over it. Um, the volume control operates as you slide your finger. Can you see it going up no, and down on the screen there? Mm. And equally, if you want to uh, change the station, you can cycle through them with a mere glide of your finger. Mm. Which I just think, you know, is an exquisite thing. It's really, really simple to operate. It sounds good and it looks even better. Unless you've got kids that put their little mucky fingers all over it. Which I have, which is why I probably won't be buying one. Have a look at this. This is the smallest dab receiver in the world. Wow, it's awesome. Trinlock Fusion, it's called. And um, it doesn't look that sexy, I don't think. But the fact that it's so tiny is brilliant. It's one gig. Hmm. So you've got normal FM radio, DAB radio, and MP3. Really? And it supports other files as well. It's a beautiful thing, I think, because it's so Absolutely. tiny. Very, very light. It's and um, it's also, phones. yeah, got JPEG uh, viewing here. So I'll just download some pictures. Oh, I do. There's John. And oh. uh, it's a little bit slow, but there we are. Look, in the Gadget Show studio. And that's the mm. Trinlock Fusion. Do you like that? Yes. Yeah. But crucially, what's the battery life like? 10 hours. 10 hours on 10 DAB. 10 hours on DAB. Wow. And about 22 hours of MP3. Mm, that's that's bad. Impressive. That's impressive. really good. One of the more bizarre sounding types of digital camera you'll hear people talking about is the so-called bridge camera. They're all about bridging a gap between a top-of-the-range compact camera and a bottom-of-the-range entry-level digital SLR. In principle, they sound like a great idea. But are they a great compromise or horribly flawed mutants? To find out, I decided to test three particularly talented-looking examples. Nearest to the compact end of the range in size and price, there's this Sony DSC-H2. More SLR-like in appearance, the Fuji Finepix S6500. And almost SLR-like in size and price, there's this Panasonic Lumix FZ50. To test them, I went on three challenging photo assignments. First, I tried them out with some portrait photography, but instead of taking portraits of people, I went to the Boston and District Canine Society show to photograph dogs. 
each one came with their own oversized vanity case and a beauty technician. They all looked their Sunday best, and the owners are expecting me to do their treasures justice. I started with the cheapest of my three cameras, the Sony. I don't know, I don't think these will be the best pictures you've seen taken of, of oh, Leah, is yeah. it? Is Leah. It? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you like that? Oh, it's yeah. good, isn't it? All these cameras have much longer lenses than a normal compact. Even the Sony, which is the smallest of the three, has a 12 times zoom. So I can get further away from the subject and still get a frame-filling shot. Though longer lenses magnify camera shake, something the Sony's steady shot couldn't quite eliminate. And flash wasn't flattering. It's interesting, you get green eye rather than red eye with a Shih Tzu. Next, I tried out the Fuji on what looked like a baby lion. Actually, a well-groomed Chow Chow. The problem is, getting a shot with any of these cameras with a dog that's remotely animated is almost impossible. The shutter lag is much worse than you'd get from a digital SLR, and it um, really is most frustrating. It's the only camera here with a true wide-angle lens, though it has the shortest zoom overall, 10.7 times, and it still tended to take the picture just a moment too late. Last, the Panasonic, most expensive of the three. Like the Sony, it has a 12 times zoom. And, like the Fuji, it has SLR-style controls. Plus, it also has optical image stabilization. In theory, it's a promising combination. Yes. No. Go, I go up there. Right. Oh no, right. <laughs> well, she's looking at you now. Oh no, she wasn't. I missed it. And I was looking, no, the, she's uh, looking at you now. Look. Oh, that's brilliant, that. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, just, oh, oh. Puppy. Puppy. Oh. Higher. Higher. Puppy. Yeah. Puppy. 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 <laughs> The Panasonic's image stabilization really worked, and though its shutter lag was no better than the other cameras, it gave me the clearest and best shots from the show. After dogs, I went to take pictures of hens at a hen party, which should test our camera's abilities as point and shoot snappers. Now, I'm a bit worried because I've never been to a, a hen night before. You're right to be worried, actually. Oh, good, excellent. <laughs> The first picture was a group shot of all the girls in the bar. I chose the Fuji for this because it has the best low light settings. So I'm actually going to try the first shot without flash. Now, right, so get, get as close, close as you can. Cheers! And it's, it's not bad, actually, but I think, I, think it, I think it could be a bit better if we do it with flash. Another good feature of the Fuji is its face detection. And you see it's picking up the faces in the picture. It focuses and exposes for faces, giving very natural-looking snaps with Fuji's well-balanced flash. Group shot over, it's time to leave the bar. And I'm encouraged to join in with the hen party antics, which is a bit difficult with three cameras bouncing round your neck. Much to my concern, the night was only just beginning, and next we were going for a ride in a brand new limo. How would the Panasonic, the biggest of our cameras, cope in the relatively confined space of the car? Ooh, this should be fun. I never realised these things were so dark inside. Um, however, thankfully, the, all the cameras have pop-up flashes, which gives a bigger distance between the lens and the flash, which should help reduce red eye. And if I can see what I'm shooting, you can see that it works. But it worked pretty well, actually. The flash was nearly as good as the Fuji's, and the Panasonic screen twists and turns so I could easily view it wherever I held the camera. Mr. Cameraman. Next, it's pole dancing. Night of firsts for me. So far, the cameras were keeping up with the hen night action. For this experience, I chose the Sony. Relatively compact, it should be the best of the three for a night out. It's going to get a better angle so we can get something a bit more exciting from there. Yeah. But wherever I tried, I was failing to get the shots I wanted. The Sony took what seemed like an eternity to recharge its flash, and so long to focus that most of the time the action was over by the time I'd taken the picture. Right, two tests down, and the Panasonic and Fuji are in the lead, but it's hard to tell which is best. Bye! Bye! <laughs> To decide between them, I set out to take a few pictures of one of Britain's most beautiful landscapes, Snowdonia. 
When I arrived, the sky was grey, it was pouring down with rain, and everything looked very, very bleak. But the British weather never stays the same for long, and all three cameras were at least very light to carry round. There's a disadvantage to the small size, though. In order to get that huge lens range into a small camera, they've had to use a smaller sensor than you'd find on a digital SLR, which could compromise the quality of the shots. I had no shortage of photo opportunities. But I soon realised that the only way to determine which was the best camera was to take a shot of exactly the same part of the landscape. With the help of an assistant, I set the cameras up on three tripods, looking at a scene with a particularly demanding range of light and contrast. And we took the shots at exactly the same moment. Three, two, one. Well, I'm hoping you two will help me make up my mind. I've printed out the landscape shot and uh, one of Poppy and somebody from the Hen Knight for each camera. But the colours seem very real, don't they? This is very sort of greyed out, isn't it? This seems really quite soft. This one particularly, I think, mm. is superb. Number three. That one's yeah. the one. After careful deliberation, there was a general agreement that camera number one, the Fuji, was best for colour, sharpness and contrast. With the Panasonic in second place and the Sony in third. Is it a compromise, a good compromise, between a, a compact and an SLR? A sort of half compromise, because you really just don't get the speed of the SLR, you don't get the nice optical viewfinder of the SLR, but the long lens is useful. So, if it's right for you, yes, it is a, a reasonable compromise, but just be aware there are limitations. OK. okay. Time for the mm. rating? Yep. Yeah. All right, John. First of all, uh, the Fuji. How many Gs? 4G, because it is the best, I think, in terms of image quality, and it's the quickest, and that's really important in a, in a camera, I think. Panasonic 3Gs, it's still a great camera, and for some people I think the image stabilisation might be very important, and the longer lens, but the noise at high sensitivity, bit of a problem. So 3Gs for the Panasonic, and also 3Gs for the Sony, because it's uh, great out there in the landscape, good colours, it still has its good features, but the uh, lack of responsiveness really lets it down. Join us after the break, when we put our two large flat screen TVs to the ultimate test, TV football. We're watching football matches and sport in neat movement. Right, now it's time to return to our great big flat screen TV for a flipping low price gadget show challenge. You said that without breathing once. Thank you. Very impressive. Now, the idea was that Susie and I had to find uh, the biggest flat screen TVs we could for under a grand. The only rules were they had to be HD ready and 40 inches or over. I got this gorgeous 40 inch LCD from Samsung for £989. And I got this gorgeous 42-inch plasma from Panasonic, and it cost me £879. So, having bought the TVs, we had to test them to find out which one was the best. And to do that, we came up with a pretty neat test. Stage one was the filming of a whole football match between Farsley Celtic and Worcester City. We sent along three gadget show camera people to capture the action. Stage two was to edit the shots from all three cameras together to create a video of the whole football match lasting 90 minutes. Finally, stage three of the preparations was to create our own mini indoor football pitch and put our chosen flat screen TVs at either end where the goals would normally go. Yeah. OK, this is how it's going to work. We've made a DVD of the football match we filmed last week. And we've invited some very passionate football fans Yay! to come and watch the match on our chosen tellies. Obviously, they're going to naturally gravitate to whichever the two TVs, plasma or LCD, they think looks best. So basically, whichever TV has the best territorial advantage over the 90 minutes will be the winner. So let's blow the whistle and introduce our commentator, Gary Bloom. And it's game on, LCD versus Plasma, in a match that promises to be very tight indeed. A real clash of the titans, you might say, as watching football on the telly really tests how well a screen copes with factors like motion blur and the burning in effects of TV graphics. Come down, look at mine. Come look at the Plasma. Remember, this isn't about which of the two presenters you like most, because obviously that would be, I would win. And so far we've been seeing a lot of tentative moves from the fans, but as the match settles down, we're likely to get a good impression of exactly which TV has the upper hand. So, Farsley have taken the lead with a lovely strike from Damien Reeves, 
But in the all-important match being played out in this rather desolate warehouse, things are still too close to call. This is your TV of choice. It has to be the plasma. Suze, can I just jump in for a second? You do realise, though, that if you actually ran this at home for, say, a couple of days, that image would be burnt in permanently to your screen. You'd never get oh, that's it. absolute nonsense. Screen so burn on plasma is end. a nightmare. A gram got Susie two inches more on her plasma, which gives her a size advantage, but Jason's comments about screen burn and the bright colours on his Samsung LCD mean that as the first half draws to a close, he's got just over half the fans watching at his end. But the competition is by no means won. This is a match of two halves, and as we've seen so many times before, Jason can often flatter to deceive when the chips are in the broth. I think that's right. I think you, the motion does get blurred on the uh, LCD screen, certainly. Now, as we start the second half, Jason's confident his LCD is the technology of the future. And Susie's pulling out all the birds in the bush and trying to convince the fans that they should opt for the more natural colours on her plasma. The colours are better, aren't they? The colours are stronger, they're more, they're more real, they're truer colours. Think about the amount of time that you have text on, if you watch, if you watch sport, for example. Oh, come if you on. use the electronic programming guide in your free view or We're your sky. We're not playing computer games here. We're watching football matches and sport. We need movement. We don't need blurring. Blurry <laughs> screen, blurry screen, blurry screen. You know, it's not a chance if you're doing it on your own. <laughs> <laughs> And as we reach the final whistle, the result seems completely in the balance. Time to bring in our ref, John Bentley, to give the final score. The results. Well, at half-time, Jason had the territorial advantage. Ooh. It was 60-40 in favour wow. of the LCD. Right. But during the second half, Susie staged a dramatic recovery. <laughs> but not quite dramatic enough to Hooray! secure victory. In the end, the verdict from our esteemed judges was equal, 50-50. In Plasma versus LCD, it was a draw. Yay! Hooray! Hooray! Well done. Thank you, Ralph. Well <laughs> Yay! Oh! Yeah, draw. No, but I'm never that disappointed with a draw, I've got to be honest. Well, I'm not either. I've obviously been a Wolves fan. OK. <laughs> so, <laughs> should we give them a, a G rating? Yep. So, for the Samsung LCD, we give it four Gs. And the Gadget Show rating for the Panasonic Plasma is four Gs. And if you're looking to me to provide the casting vote, just because I'm wearing this stupid shirt, you're going to be disappointed. Because <laughs> I've asked around and some people prefer plasma, some people prefer LCD. But we're not going to be indecisive, because if you want a big plasma for under a grand, the best you can get is this Panasonic. And if you want a big LCD for under a grand, the best you can get is this Samsung.